What about globally? I mean, you guys work with Mumbai Indians, coach, assistant coach. Are, are you seeing, oh, only a couple of years in, but are you seeing the levels of franchise cricket go up year on year? Would yeah, you? I mean, it's scary, like the amount of talent that isn't even on the radar of the people that it should be, like some of the young girls who come through the trials, which a lot would spend a lot of time at. They are so, so talented and it's they haven't even been recognised yet. And that's like, it's a bigger conversation about who gets the opportunity and who doesn't in sport and, and elite sport. And the girls who turn up to the trials that we've seen, it's like they've been learning their game on the streets in India and they could become the next best player for India, but they're just not yet being given that opportunity. So, yeah, absolutely in India, there is so much untapped talent. Um, and, yeah, that makes it really, really exciting, I think, for, for India and obviously the global game because we need more countries challenging Australia now. I think people are pretty bored of the narrative of Australia winning all the competitions, which is fair. You want it to be competitive. So, yeah, that, that would be my, my view. I think watch out India in the next five years. Some of the talent I just saw in the, um, the trials this year all types of bowlers, the batters who don't even know how good they are at the moment. I think a great example was we picked a girl called Sa Sajina in, in our, and the first game she went and I played her first ball in the WPL this year and she hit it for six. And I don't think I think she was more surprised than anyone on the pitch, but we knew she had that ability to do that. And that's what's so great about coaching, isn't it? That you untap that type of talent that, um, yeah. And you just feel there is so many more players like her in India who um, who just want that opportunity, that platform to perform at. Is South Africa a good example of those that perhaps are experiencing franchise cricket and that's helping their international side yeah, we, prosper we, a bit more? We were having this discussion and I, and I think New Zealand benefited off that maybe three years ago where there were six players. Maddie Green was one, Hannah Rowe was sort of around the mixer in terms of the environments. But you look at South Africa, I think they had eight players in the WBBL, not last year but the year before. and A lot of players... Uh, internationally have relied on those franchise leagues because they're playing more competitive cricket and while it's the best and the best continue to get those opportunities it actually has enabled their international teams to be better and then what they can bring back to their their you know, I think Tasman Brits how she scored runs and being able to bat with Asune loose that's played in, in competitions you see Nadine de Klerk you see Marazan Cap I know Ishmael isn't there and Lizelle Lee who have retired and Dane Van Niekirk but there was a big core of that South African team that has got better by playing franchise cricket and sometimes you actually have to rely on other countries to lift the standard I'm sure it's the same with the 100 but it's actually a big concern for the game because some of these players now are choosing to go completely franchise and we're missing out on the likes of Ishmael playing for South Africa um, I guess Dane she, she I think was retired in the end but you feel like some of the South Africans are going to have to choose sometimes now between franchise. Where, oh, go on then, where does all this head? I, I mean, I know it's a bit sort of, you know, looking so far ahead, it's difficult. But do you, I mean, the men's game it has the same issue in some ways that franchise cricket is such a lure, financially life-changing opportunities. Do you see that perhaps being the same with the women's game down the line a little bit more? Yeah, but it's, it's happened quite too soon for us in many ways because we need those players playing international cricket to, to for that to yeah. remain strong and that's what's the biggest concern at the moment that they're going to choose this franchise route because they're not given NOCs to play in the big tournaments because they're overlapping the tournaments now and so and do you think there'll be even more tournaments now yeah and and I think the fact that my personal opinion is they have to make an international window for the WBL, the WPL and, and the 100 for us to keep having the best product at a World Cup well, you that's think about the WPL, that's probably the only tournament from a women's perspective, and maybe the 100 a little bit, where it's actually a pure, every international player is available. And I think you, you talk about the draft and players that have played in, I guess, those festival um, in India, they're going, hang on, why have I not been picked? But ultimately, every international player is available. So I agree, I think those three tournaments are the main tournaments that you can earn big bucks, like big money, career-changing money for people. Um, and then... I think also it comes down to each governing body to say we actually have to think about the female game slightly different, yeah. not just those 
those windows, but also saying, look, we have to provide flexibility because the amount the guys can earn is, I mean, Nick, you've been in the IPL and some of the money those guys are on is huge. So how do we enable the best players to play in those three leagues and then also allow that not to impact international cricket? Because the girls aren't playing as much as the guys internationally and there's not as many franchise leagues as what we're seeing popping up in the men's cricket as well. So there is that opportunity to bring those clean windows in. Yeah, I mean, I'm going into a looking at the WBBL draft this year and there will be not many international players playing in it on the back of a World Cup that finishes three days before and a, a numerous series being played in, just in the middle, which I just think it's, you know, these are one of the biggest competitions for the women's game and we're not allowing our best players to play in them and I think you, there should be that flexibility to play international cricket around them. There's nine more months a year to do that and... I feel we've just got to understand that that's just as important. I was going to ask Heather that, actually. I mean, it seems a while ago since Heather was sat here and we were chatting with her. She spoke really well. And I was going to ask her because she didn't go to the WPL. She got asked, I think, to go, um, would have got a decent contract, but she said no because England were playing in New Zealand and she was England captain and she wanted to be part of that. So that was a big not a big move but it was a move she chose to make but it's not necessarily the move that other players are making do, do you think that that's gonna I, I suppose perhaps I'll rephrase that has the women's game got a chance to perhaps learn from some of the errors the men's game made when this started to develop and evolve yeah I, I think with Heather's situation she's obviously in a good spot because she's probably got a good England contract she's done pretty well recently so for her it was more about the stage of the career that she's at obviously she's captain as well so that was the route that she wanted to go, go down I think the concern for me is going back to South Africa is is South Africa haven't got to World Cup finals because their governing body has invested a good amount of money and that their players are really well looked after and it's great because they've developed them and now they're playing franchise cricket. They're not in a position to say no to franchise cricket because they're not got good enough contracts from their own governing body. So my concern for South Africa, South African cricket moving forwards is this generation of cricketers are going to depart at some point and South Africa cricket are going to be left with no depth because they haven't invested in their structure, similar to, yeah. to, to New Zealand. So I'm not concerned about people like Heather missing certain things or choosing to go to certain things because our England players are really well looked after and you would hope that they would always put England first but my bigger concern is around the nations like South Africa and, and New Zealand and, and West Indies as well yeah, you could yes. add into that I see I look at the WBBL and I so the new rule that's coming this year and like you'll probably explain it better is that so a player can sign for three years but they have to be available for three years now Mealy Kerr was the first name that was announced Amelia well, Kerr's 23 years old. You've got Marazan Cap, you've got Chamari Atapatu, and Atapatu said she's going to retire. So how, how does Amelia Kerr know in two years' time what New Zealand are going to be playing? So is she going to therefore make herself unavailable for New Zealand to make sure she has her commitment to, to Lottie's team, which Lottie will ensure that she commits to her contract? So there's those concerns for me is that, well, I think it's fantastic. It means that the WBBL can have those best players... It says to me, hang on, are they then therefore going to be lost to international cricket because they have to commit to that one franchise league that they've got? So those are things where where is the flexibility of that on the governing body to say, yeah, we will give them NOCs or for the players to be more aware of actually in three years' time, what, what's my commitments to my country? Merely Kerr's captain in three years' time for New Zealand, then what's that situation going to look like? What, what's the chat? It might be a difficult one to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, with some of the girls you're working with some of the players you're working with is there a lot of talk about franchise cricket is the focus very much still international cricket where's the balance there because obviously opportunities are out there um, what's your gut feeling about where the domestic game is in England particularly or in fact globally about what players are thinking about I think for, first and foremost players want to play international cricket and that's and that's what we all want, is it? We want everyone, all the best players to be playing international cricket. And, I, and that's certainly the vibe I get. Um, but we're talking big money now, you know, WPL, um, WBBL. And if you've got a hundred contract, that's, that's really, really well paid. And, and I think 
that's where we need to have that flexibility from ICC, from all the governing bodies to say, OK, we'll work with the players on this rather than working against them and pushing people out of the game. Because I think if we have a strong international cricket, really strong domestic cricket, I think we can really take this game to the next level and I think that's what we need to do. And um, But I think we all need to work together <laughs> because otherwise we will it, fall it, in that it, trap. Uh, I mean, you know, you're all big names in the women's game, right? So, and, and you'll know the women's game inside out. Have these, or do, do you expect these conversations to happen generally? I mean, you're looking at me and smiling now. Do, do you think, I mean, you're hoping they're going to happen. Realistically, how do you make them happen or do they happen? I, I really don't know. I'm not that close enough to Governor well, maybe my, we I mean, need to encourage people to talk to you guys. <laughs> well, I, I not just that think... We, not that we have any influence on it either. Yeah, I, I, just, I just hope someone's going to see that the fact that, you know, the international game might be weaker soon. You know, who, who, how do we know off the back of the T20 World Cup in Bangladesh that three or four big players are going to um, retire from international cricket and say we're taking the franchise route? Because you could see it happening. Yeah. With some Sophie Devine's probably one of those names that come to mind. Like if yeah. she's not New Zealand captain, is she saying, look, I'm going to take a contract up with Perth? And, and that's, that's my point about Melee. Are we, are we going to lose players to international cricket because they want to go and take these contracts at 28? It's... I mean, Millie's 23, but that, that's my concern. I think it's a great outcome in terms of what WBBL are trying to do. But then is that a kick in the butt to those governing bodies to say, how do we work with the ICC to get that window to say, we don't want to lose someone from international cricket to be able to go and earn the money in the franchise league? But it shouldn't be that, like the term, like kicking the butt, like that's the governing bodies not being proactive enough to recognise actually we should have done this five years ago. It only happens when suddenly they realise they're in a bad situation and it's like, do you know what I mean? It's like yeah, they yeah. should be thinking ahead and understanding that investment's needed, not when suddenly you're in a rubbish situation and you suddenly realise that you have to make investments. It's just, you just hope, would hope that they are more proactive than, than they're currently being at the moment, I think. I'm just putting myself back all those years ago when you, you play and you're trying to impress a selector, a coach, you know, you guys, if you're playing with Charlotte Edwards and Lydia Greenway, you think, hang on, if I, if I get 100 here, or I get five wickets, so I do really well, that might have a big impact on my future because it might mean that there are opportunities down the line. I mean, you, you were with Heather. Heather said, Lindsay Smith bowled really well yeah. to me, and all of a sudden she's playing for England now. I mean, these influences are out there. Let's not try and hide them. They are out there. And you get further in the women's game, won't you, because yeah. the depth of talent's not there. And, and, and that was great to hear that Heather said that. From domestic cricket, hopefully every domestic player in this country is listening to that and saying, this is great. There is, we're being recognised at domestic cricket for, for performing well. And, and even the 100 coming up, you feel like this is a massive opportunity for some young players. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's exciting. I mean, there are so many opportunities and we could have only dreamed of that in 2004, couldn't we, when we were running around out here doing relay throws. Um, <laughs> From 55 34 metres. or 41. <laughs> <laughs> but, like... Yeah, I mean, they're good conversations, but you hope these conversations higher up are happening and um, everyone works together for the better of the game. And I, I think the men's game's in a similar position. It, it could get to a point that franchise cricket actually is more like club football. and you Because there are so many tournaments in the men's game at the moment and, and you expect that, you know, the CPL's on in the women's game. You've got the potentially the MLC maybe in the women's game as well and then the SA20 for the South African women's as well so there's going to be more of those competitions that do come about and I think in the men's game they're finding that as a real challenge at the moment and that they're able to say okay we're going to allow some players to go and play franchise cricket and that yeah we are going to bring in maybe B teams for certain stuff I know in New Zealand New Zealand cricket's remunerated from players going and playing in the IPL so therefore they can miss New Zealand tournaments and and I think people are now starting to understand and get their head around that a little bit more in the men's game but in the women's game I guess from our perspective we're so protective of we want the best players at international cricket but also get the opportunities to to get enough money to have a career, to have a life after cricket. Yeah, but the thing in the men's game, they put a, they put a B team out and it's, it's very competitive. Yep. In, in any of these teams, you put a B team out, that's not competitive and it's not good for the game. And that's what I, I'm trying to say is international cricket should be the absolute pinnacle of what we do. And we want the best players playing and there shouldn't be any reason why they're not playing other than that they don't want to, not because they're being told not to play. Yeah. So I, I, I'm really big on this because, you know, I'm, we're passionate about women's cricket. And you want, 
you want hopefully in Bangladesh to have a, another yeah. brilliant tournament, which we saw in South Africa in whenever it was, 2022. Was well, it? we've got the World Cup here and T20 World Cup here in what 2026 Six. as well. We want some of these the best players in the world. And absolutely. They might. I mean, you could teach them the relay through then as well, Lottie. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope that all the leading cricket authorities have been listening to you guys chat, and maybe they'll uh, get in touch with you guys and get your views. But the changing landscape, the ever-changing landscape of cricket, and that's in the men's game and in the women's game.